Hello, everybody. Uh, I want to welcome you to Quiet Before. My name is John Santos, and I'm here with Christian Henson and Ben Allen. How are you guys doing? Good, good. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> Thanks for getting together and making the time to do this. I know that both of you are in the Philippines right now. I was hoping maybe we could hear from Christian, uh, if you want to give an intro, and then Ben, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, hi. Um, my name is Christian Henson. I had a, a publishing imprint that did a lot of books on works from here in the Philippines, particularly with uh, in, in, in partnership with Clara Balaguer, who's a cultural worker slash uh, writer, but also like other organizations here, as well as works with uh, artists in the Filipino diaspora. I was based in New York up until 2021, and then I just moved here to, to Manila and have, I haven't left the country since, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's me. Thank you, Christian. Ben? My name is Ben Allen. I'm a visual artist, an interdisciplinary artist who does painting, drawing, installation, weaving, performance, video, um, and some cultural works as well. I am currently in the Philippines doing a Fulbright, researching and making works about the Benig practice of indigenous Filipino communities. And it's been amazing on learning all of those and integrating it into my practice that talks about the diaspora, home, and identity. For a little bit of context, I think both of you embody in your practice this relationship to Filipino culture that has uh, really piqued my interest. Being someone that was born in Detroit, Michigan, and like many Filipino Americans, Filipino Americans, Philippinex Americans, uh, we gaze towards the Philippines for those of us who don't spend a lot of time there. And I think uh, Christian, with your practice in particular, of course, the way that there's a there's a point of view there that is immediately giving priority to a cultural backdrop, which you know, for someone who's not born there, is it's it just does nothing but. I think peak curiosity and inspiring. And similarly, when I had met Ben, the way that Ben was approaching his relationship to cultural practice and doing it in a way that is uniquely their own. When I, I heard of this idea that we should get you two to talk, um, I thought that to be very compelling. And coincidentally, since Ben is in the Philippines right now, on a really basic level, th this is, I think, why we're drawn to both of your work. And with that context, um, you know, the first question would be about how this culture and the history of, of, of maybe both the place and relationship, our relationship to this place, how has that affected your work? Like, and, and or how is it a, a part of the process of um, doing the work? So one thing that uh, I find is spot history, right? Um, and the culture. You realize, especially like the, the more you dig into it, the more you realize like, uh, everyone's experience with that is very individual and that um, at, the more you know, the more you don't know um, in, in, a, in a great way where like it's like a constant discovery, rediscovery. I'm from uh, uh, L.A. originally. And during this during an era in America where it was all about assimilation, not just with Filipino Americans, but of a lot of Mexican American friends who can't speak Spanish and down the line with other uh, diaspora communities that a lot is lost in the, um, that direct translation and uh, in learning more and sort of being immersed in the language here more. Like you just clean all these little facets that you don't know. For example, there's a lot of Indian Sanskrit words that are in Tagalog. And when we always thought, oh yeah, all the loan words were maybe from Spanish or Malay. Actually, there's like, yeah, like this deeper history, this deeper well of uh, just interesting facts, but things that kind of empower you. And then, of course, also interfacing with, you know, more local historic traumas, you know, you know, like obviously the current political situation. This interview comes at an interesting time, having just moved here and sort of re like kind of, I thought moving here would be like almost like, oh, I'll just move here. I've, I've done projects here. It's, it's going to be this easy jump, but it's been more of like a pivot or like I'm really sort of, as I learn new things, as I as I see new opportunities, sort of like waiting out what that'll be. But yeah, Christian, you mentioned a, a sense of lost in what you said there, and I think for me, it comes from a personal experience. 
of kind of being born in the Philippines, leaving the Philippines, you know, developing my adulthood in Canada and in the U.S. And so I, I feel also a sense of lost, but lost for me was forced. When I moved to North America, I had to erase everything. Um, like language, my local language, my mother tongue. I had to erase some of my identity, uh, my traditions, food even, uh, and culture um, in order for me to kind of be socially mobile um, and adapt to like the new language, new environment, new society, new place, new everything. And so for me, there is a lot of kind of like learning and relearning and unlearning that's happening um, in my practice and retracing and tracing back my culture, my identity, my history, and integrating that into the, the, the work that I'm doing in the studio, but also into the work that I'm doing, being an individual and being a Filipino in America. I acknowledge the loss that I've done to myself, but I'm also uh, making ways to go back to the motherland and relearning its culture and taking everything again um, and kind of like putting it in my body, putting it in my soul, putting it in my heart and putting it in my work. And I think that that's how it, in, uh, how, that's how culture and Philippine history and identity as well integrate into the work that I'm doing now. It's interesting to actually con compare and contrast both of your lived experience because this idea of, of losing uh, losing the culture. Christian and I think, well, being born in America, it's almost like there was something there that was missing from the beginning. So our perception of what's lost, very different. And I just need to make a point and say that by the time I had um, seen what Christian and Clara were doing with um, hardworking, good looking, it didn't occur to me that I, when I was growing up, I couldn't imagine anything like that happening. Meaning like, oh, you can actually take Filipino culture and put it at the forefront of your work rather than hide it, right? So this, this the, you know, tago nang tago, the hiding, right? Like, yeah. uh, and this idea that we're hiding, right? So what's really interesting is that, you know, the culture had just moved in such a way where I wasn't tracking. And for Christian and Clara to have said, hey, at the very front of this work is the Filipino-ness, right? And being uh, um, somebody who, in a very 1970s and 80s fashion, assimilated to the majority culture, that's what you're thinking as someone born in America. As a jumping off point, there is this idea of place and geography. So, so with the next question, it, it, it really begs the question because also, Ben, you, you know, you do say lost, right? And, but actually, you're, you're coming back to... The United States, um, right? Like in a month, right? And so Christian- in like 18 days. <laughs> and, and, right. And so what's really interesting is that Christian now, he is a, he is a part of the, the culture that he was representing in my mind through publication, his publication practice and, and his way of life and his way of being, you know, now he lives in the Philippines, right? So I'm curious to know now if you center this idea of place, how does that- impact both of you you know place, place is big i think that like um you know even though i was like doing works that centered on filipino-ness it was still in the diaspora in new york or in california it's like very like armchair ivory tower definitely to the taste of hopefully filipino americans filipino diaspora but also um the, a western audience but being here is like a, just a completely different experience being filipino american gives me a lot of privilege compared to the average Filipino. Being here um, during lockdowns, like you couldn't really go into Manila, there weren't really events. And so um, me and my wife and our families, we, we tended to go out into nature a lot more. And that was the most shocking thing, like having connections more with um, a mountain range, plains, um, different trees, like just this relationship to the earth in a way that I didn't have necessarily in the state. It just like felt like I'm sitting on top or standing physically on top of all this history. But I'm also out of place here. Like um, 
my acts, I look a certain way, but then my accent is like a, a really big tell. It's funny, I'm also like holding it down for Filipino Americans. And I realize like how American I am and how actually Filipino Americans really did create like this, this own distinct identity, community, aesthetic, what have you, that I'm very proud of actually, especially like Filipinos all over California and Filipino Canadians, everyone um, expressing their experiences in their own unique ways. It's been also really nice going into the provinces and you realize actually how much the history of the Philippines essentially is just the history of Manila. It has such a Manila bias that like we can't ignore. And so when you're going out into smaller provinces, I mean, then you can talk more to this too, especially if the design cultures are completely different. Um, and it's just really great that actually here locally, more of those stories, more of that culture, more of that cuisine is giving, it's like getting its uh, day in the sun. And, and, and there's just more of this localism, this regionalism that's, that's really exciting right now. Place is a big thing for me too, um, with my practice and just just me in general, and, and, and also the idea of place making. I, I guess when I was kind of finding my voice as an artist in the US, I have been kind of thinking about the idea of place, but place, in the Philippines or place of the Philippines, um, of Filipino people, Filipino American people, maybe. And this is because I have been missing that all my life in the US. I mean, I, I have like few Filipino friends, but then most of the people that I engage with are non-Filipinos. During my time at RISD, I've been really trying to kind of build a Filipino community and build a place for that community. And I have met a few people who are doing the same thing. And it's it's just so amazing that I am bringing all of those values here in the Philippines, doing Fulbright here. But then I realized that like being here in the Philippines and the idea of, of the place that I have been thinking is so different than when I'm in the US. I feel like when I'm here in the Philippines, I just feel so free. I feel liberated in some way. Like I have... Yeah like immediate family here, uh, the food that I wanted to eat, the, the history that I wanted to uh, kind of learn or accessibility of those history that I can't get back in the US, uh, traditions, music, dancing, textiles, costume, clothing, everything. I feel like all of those elements makes a place and kind of like Connecting that to the work that I'm doing, which is banig, I feel like banig making and and the object it, it, uh, itself is a place. It becomes it it makes a place for that weaver or for Filipino people or for that local indigenous community, depending on the region. Also, I wanted to kind of like add that like when I think of place, I think of people and I think of my family. I think of my family that I have like not seen in such a long time and every time I go back there they just kind of like you know prepare you food and prepare the the your your bedroom and I think that there is such a connectedness and there is I mean Filipino values is very family-centered and, and I have been missing that back in the U.S. and experiencing that here again I was like oh like I feel like a child again I feel um, like this cute little band uh, that's like so innocent that just loving everything that's happening in the space. And I feel like that is because of my family who's placemaking uh, the experience um, of that kid. And, and I'm, 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 I'm relieving that moment again. I'm relieving that experience again as an adult in a different less lens with different values. I wanted to embrace that more. Um, not just place making as a or not just place as a sense of land or as a sense of a space, but place making as a sense of people and community um, and also tradition like food, music, chanting and dancing. Both of you are bringing to mind a perception um, of a fear that because I've been to the Philippines quite a few times as an adult. And let me tell you that from from what my dad would explain to me, I was scared. We're not talking about this, but you're going to get kidnapped. And I've actually buried that, that trauma. When I think about going home, when I've thought about going home on one major trip, 
you know, I'm only remembering right now that I was warned by my family to not go to the province, to not do this, to not do that, to not interact with this kind of, for, with my generation, it's like the idea of going, just going to the Philippines is like a pretty challenging and, and it's a, you know, I have to recognize, I want to acknowledge that, that, yeah. that you can imagine, it's hard for me to explain to other friends of mine. Yeah. Like imagine your family telling you not to go to your, to your, to your home country because of reasons A, B, and C, and D. That trauma is really real. I, I think that especially from a certain era, that's the trauma that they have lived through with the stories that they were they told. And so when we talk about generational trauma, I think that's a kind of fear that they instill in you about your own culture. There has been a lot of advancements. I mean, it still has a lot of challenges, but relatively, at least within certain spaces, it's, it's much safer. And then, you know, for all the fear that our, our folks instill in us, you know, there's all these like European back, Australian backpackers, just like walking around the province, flip flops, like <laughs> Bahala na, like no, like, like whatever, God take the wheel. Um, <laughs> so like, they're okay. I feel like, yeah, like it's like kind of like what Ben mentioned, uh, you have to unlearn a lot of these, um, these things that were taught to us about our own country, you know? Yeah. Ben, you were remarking, though, about... Right, because, like, I have the same experience, like, being here in the Philippines. And even being a Fulbright, there are places that we can't go to. Like, yeah. I mean, the now, we're kind of like, we can't go on that area yeah. uh, just for safety reason. But I'm like, yeah. my, but the banay that I'm doing, the weaving that I'm doing is so rich there, and I can't access that place for, mm -hmm. like, safety reasons. But then even with my, like, immediate family and friends, they were like, oh... Be careful when you go to this area. Be careful yeah. when you go to this specific yeah. locale just because we don't want you to get hurt or taken away or like feel something. I mean, I was just kind of remarking mm. this to a friend of mine when I went to Sikihor. And Sikihor is an island in Visayas um, that is known for their healing practices, but also with their mystical practices. Yeah. Um, tags as witches and as kind of like bad people who does something with it, it magic. Um, but, but then I wanted to recognize that those things are not real in a way. You know, they, they just don't like look at people and they will make them sick. What I do is that when I visit, you know, a place or, or a province, I always like give respect when I like enter the island or when I set foot on the land, I, I do uh, some kind of like ritual in my head or like a chant in my head or kind of like a prayer in a way of like kind of asking for guidance, asking for um, kind of like an, an, an entrance blessing in a way of not disrespecting anything, but I wanted to be there to acknowledge their history, their people and their land. Some of my family and some of my friends just cannot understand that. Uh, so they like kind of like, oh, just, just be careful. Like don't interact with certain people um, and all of those. And I, I think that there is a trauma there that we couldn't erase or, you know, I, I know that they're just looking up for me, but I feel like maybe, maybe let's, let's, let's go there and let's find out for ourselves on how just beautiful the culture and the, the people are. And it's not as bad as you think it is. I also don't want to diminish the, the voice of our, the people who, who have these, opinions and advice to give us there are dangers um not not different not any different than if you're traveling maybe in another country um that um have certain types of perspectives and views towards outside people um and and i think you know it's important to recognize that um some of those fears are caused by cultural forces that are not necessarily um about filipinoness per se specifically but more along the lines of like groups of people who want to separate right um themselves from the majority and the cultural norm and um it's i think we're we're we have such seen such a sea change in culture of how um we relate to um not just indigenous people but um i think what you earlier you were ben you were you were talking about um maybe how healing cultures like uh, cultures who are in, integrating indigenous practices in their work like how those cultures are viewed by like a modernizing like majority culture um and so you know it's interesting to think you got me thinking about well there's a discourse in the united states about um you know how like the witch hunt and how people within communities who are seen to have like healing powers were thought of as witches and you know there was a kind of a, a religious um sort of context for like how 
these views were um, disseminated and, and like um, how, how as a culture we view magic. I love hearing both of the contrasts in both of your responses. So I just wanted to, to move to the next question, which is, a, it was really about um, being Filipino American and, and, and least in, in of the re recent generations. I think Ben, um, you're a bit younger than me. Uh, and Christian is a little bit younger than me, but I think you're even a, a, bit, a bit further away in a generation. As we talked about earlier, Ben, we feel this kind of disconnect um, from, from the Philippines, right? And so I guess, Christian, I'm asking you to maybe go back before you lived there and um, mm -hmm. to talk a little bit about like, how did that disconnect inform your work? How did you navigate what could be that chasm of being far from home? You know, I saw Ben doing a performance not too long ago. It, his work, it manifests purely that, um, the chasm, right? Yeah. But, and, and Christian, I think you're a little bit different in that, like wanting to share knowledge with um, your audiences. You're sharing the disconnect at a time when you are actually still disconnected. So speak to that time yeah. before you actually lived in the Philippines and uh, mm -hmm. like kind of how that informed your work. I think uh, maybe you, uh, you can relate like where, you know, you're born in the States and you want to learn about your own cultural background. A lot of times our parents aren't the best at disseminating the knowledge of our history. Being in California, you don't feel the gap so much because there's so many, there's so many Filipino communities there. Um, I never really felt like like such an outsider, but it's actually when I moved to New York where I really felt the difference. I think um, different weather, the communities are a little bit different. And I really kind of, and maybe after um, grad school and um, all these things, I kind of wanted to explore that, um, that part of my identity that before I was, I just was a California dude. <laughs> I visited my mom in, in, or like, cause my mom moved before my dad, like in, like this was in 2012. And I was just so struck, maybe just like coming out of grad school, having these, these thoughts of where to push graphic design. And I, and I just like really was like entranced by all the vernacular, like local signage and, and, and wanted to highlight local graphic designers and such. I think it's a lot different maybe now, but I really felt like the two communities were just doing their things. And, and you know, you do face like some sometimes opposition from local makers here because and I understand now, it's like so, I have so much respect for all the artists who practice uh, out here. The resources are much different. There aren't grants. There, um, there's no, yeah, there's no cultural department. Um, they just have to do with what, what they have. I can understand why sometimes they, they look at work from diaspora differently. Um, but I feel like more because of the internet and because of social media, like uh, it's flattened a lot. Uh, in terms of that that connection, like a lot of, of people here know all the like local artists, like music artists or, and fine artists in, in in the states that are practicing, and and actually vice versa. I know like a lot of friends in in the states are following like different people out here, and I felt that's kind of helped mend the gap a lot. One of the first things I felt um, when I first moved here, like the first day I woke up, was like, oh wow, like I don't explain it like the, the Filipino American experience where like. You can't just go to the bodega and order a coffee. Like you gotta order a bodega and like be the Asian representative of the community and like face all these quantum questions. Like even when you're taking a like a Uber or whatever, they're like, "Hey, brother, where are you from?" I'm like, "I'm from California." He's like, "No, where are you really from?" I'm like, "God damn!" Like I don't want to have to be asked this question all the time. These like microaggressions that you don't understand that build like build up and then hear a neighbor oh yeah like okay cool like some kind of connection like the garbage man oh cool hi and you know being Filipino American I, I feel like an outsider but everyone's like super accepting and every time I, I say something like oh yeah you know I'm still am you know whatever they're like no brother like you're Filipino too the vast majority I would say of, of people here are like very into the idea that like we're one community um, one culture no gatekeeping. I got to work on my Tagalog, but like other than that, like we're, you know, we're together. Something I really think about like, you know, pretty frequently, like what is that gap? Like, what is this, like these distances, even being here now I'm like in it and I still feel this like funny distance, but it's actually cool knowing that there are, there is like a small community also of, of Filipino Americans who have moved back with like, with different uh, circumstances. 
and they navigate it in their own way as well. I think everyone has their own unique experience with it. When I was when I was an undergrad, uh, I have been looking for Filipino community in in Dartmouth area. Um, in North Dartmouth in Massachusetts and there's not a lot but then a friend of mine introduced me to this group called District One and they are Filipino or Filipino American um, who are in college, in college different colleges in Massachusetts and they kind of connect together and create a gathering that presents Filipino culture in terms of dancing and clothing and cooking. When I visited there and I, I became part of the show, because um, it's a show for themselves uh, uh, and by themselves, um, I went there to visit and I really felt like this is so different in terms of like like showing Filipino culture uh, in such young generations because um, I, I felt a, a bit older than them actually uh, but then they, they they are kind of looking to connect more some most of them actually were uh, was not born in the Philippines and they haven't been to the Philippines some of them are uh, just like me who are immigrants and who have been kind of uh, um, their reference of, of of what's happening in the Philippines, but being there and experiencing all of those, um, you know, different values and different points of views, it was very, very fascinating for me to see people who tackle Filipino ness differently, and I and I wanted to do that with my work by kind of integrating their stories and their experiences, um, especially with my performance of kind of this longing. Uh, or trying to go back and retracing um, and tracing again. And yeah, and kind of just like looking back at my experiences in the Philippines and how it changes over time and how my values changes when I'm in the U.S. And, and now that I'm back here, um, I feel like my Filipino values of being family-centered, of being community-centered is kind of becoming like a highlight of what I have been doing here. But then also I I I I fear that I I may have I might lose that when I go back to the US. And I I feel like I'm trying to I'm I'm trying so hard to like keep that, keep that community centerness um that I wanted to put into the work that I'm doing. Just to shake things up a little bit. <laughs> um you know I want to reference uh I remember hearing an interview with Brian Shimkovitz, who, who is the, the creator of Awesome Tapes from Africa, which is kind of a cultural mm -hmm. excavation of, um, of various beautiful forms of music that were kind of scraped from the culture. Like, he, I think he was going into record stores in Africa, and he was really just digging around to, to kind of create a record, a compilation of like, um, you know, diasporic African music. From from different periods, he did an incredible job. It was received, you know. There are some there are some people um, who who view this as a as, it's it's a really important forum. I think definitely for like the knowledge of that music to to spread. During the interview, there were um, there were several um, other people who were involved in the the sort of like um, I guess the, the the marketing of this culture, and um, not all of them are of the culture. Brian Shimkovitz, I'm I'm pretty sure he's like a um, a white scholar who grew up in Los Angeles, and part of his work was a product of a Fulbright scholarship that he had also done in Ghana. In the interview, they also talked about these European um, record labor, sorry, record label owners who were who were actually releasing the music. Very problematic, and and sort of like trying to understand like the flow of culture here, and it obviously gets more complex if you think about sampling. And the milieu of like cultural postmodernism in all of its form, uh, in all of, all of its form, music being one of the easily easily transmittable um, versions of this. You can you know the music just traveled around. In this sort of conversation with Brian talking about Austin Taste from Africa, somebody asked a question about what, how is the music that you're excavating and you know helping to spread the knowledge of around the world. How is it how is it viewed by the cultures that are actually producing it in particular the younger generation so christian said something earlier about this and i think thinking about the filipino diaspora and like 
you know, in specific, I'll just say that young people just don't care about, they didn't seem to care. They seem to care more about like mainstream hip hop in the United States in the 1990s, more than they cared about um, the, the music from their, um, from their country earlier in time. In other words, the music that he was like putting out in the world that he was like kind of um, blogging to the world is easily appreciated from the outside. Not being from someone from Africa, me being someone interested in the music and being a DJ, of course, I very much followed what he was doing and I would, I would play a lot of the music that I heard him play on his blog or that he would release um, you know, on the internet or he would like educate me about. And so there's this idea of like taking this position of like a cultural, um, like you're representing, like you're a cultural ambassador and you're representing these forms. For being an American graphic designer who's a bit older and educated, when I saw what, Phil, what Christian was doing um, with some of his publications, I was like, wow, there's like this Filipino vernacular, you know, like I didn't even really know about it, you know, like I, I cause, and so for me being Filipino there, that is such an empowering moment to know that that is, that is taking place. Um, if I could distill a question out of this, it would be, how do you take responsibility for the representation that you are putting forth in your work, both of you. So I, I'm, I'm almost extending the same question. Can you speak to that Christian? Cause you know, uh, uh, obviously a very, you put yourself in a very important position to Filipino Americans who are wanting to learn more about the culture, right? And then also how also, what is the expectation of the impact of that work on non-Filipino people? Essentially, I just wanted to make books I would want to buy. Um, and I didn't think about a larger impact. I mean, of course, I understood that of this chasm that you mentioned. Um, and then as you dive into it, you realize like, oh, you know, you have to be mindful of, of many things and be respectful. Like Ben mentioned, just come in with respect, come in with the right attitude. Because I also think that there's a lot of like, I used it before, like but gatekeeping or policing of culture. Like you can't do this because of X, Y, Z. And I just really feel like culture is like a living thing. Who's in charge of it? Like, who am I to like say you can do this and you can't do that? I feel like it comes down to like respect, whether that uh, that that engagement, like uh, clearly the the um, African tapes project you mentioned. There is a lot of respect. There's a lot of love there. He's not of the culture, but when people who are actually there see someone engage in the culture, he's like, hey, that's my guy. Then you know, like you're not thinking about it as um, purely on a cultural lines. Because I also think what all this cultural work that we're talking about and all this like um, engaging with our history, it's actually good for business for people here, you know? So that's a great thing. Like it's, it, it can be mutual, the, ben the benefits. Like what Ben's doing and more people are doing projects with Benigs. Actually, I've, I've been wanting to do like a Benig project. Hell yeah, that's, that's money in the pockets of some people out there. There is a local version, like a electronic music kind of techno here called Baduts. That was, um, it's from Davao. Um, and it has influences from Bajau culture, which are um, sea gypsies, um, nomadic sea people who are Muslim and Christian. Before, it's just something you hear in the province. Recently, actually just last weekend, um, people here locally are looking toward that and trying to be inspired by Badud. People naturally look past what's local. Now that I drive here, <laughs> um, I you know did whole projects about jeepneys, jeepney, jeepney design. And then now I look at them like, this guy is blocking traffic. Like I'm not even, I'm not even looking at <laughs> the designs anymore. I'm thinking like, how can I just overtake him and like not get an accident? Um, so you kind of, no matter what, if it's just in front of you, you look past it. Now, even locally, there is a local gaze. There was a certain era of music called OPM, which I think is even having this like interesting revival. Like it's like basically like OPM, but mixed with like emo or like indie rock. It's getting more indie, less country. I know, you know, folksy. Apparently maybe being Filipino right now is pretty cool. It's like so nice that there's like uh, this interest and, and focus on it. But I feel like if we were so bogged down in terms of like, what's the grander mission or how to be, how do I represent all this stuff? I think it can be quite paralyzing where I think like I can only represent my own unique um, circumstance. There's a lot of things that connect us, but I feel like we should all empower each other to engage with in these things rather than say like, oh, no, 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 like not this, not that. Nothing would be done if, if that was the case. I totally agree with Christian here. Everything that you said, yeah, that's same, same answer. Because um, at first I 
I just want to make work that I want. <laughs> I want to make work that yeah. I like. Um, and I re never re really realized the impact that it can make to other people. And so same, you know, I, I feel like the responsibility um, that I want to take on the work is to actually just be empowering uh, and, and empower each other um, and, and, and how I want others to empower me and, and the work as well. And for the community, I feel like. Yeah, and then kind of just engaging with them in such genuine level uh, to Filipinos and non-Filipinos and kind of educating them as well with our forgotten histories, lost histories, um, and and with uh, Filipino immigrants kind of, you know, I think by engaging with them, you, 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 you are, or we are giving them a sense of uh, place uh, or a sense of community that they may have been um, looking or missing. That's the responsibility that I want to do with the work and that I have been doing as well. There's this idea of Filipino-ness, which like when I was living in the Bay Area in my early 20s, the invisible scratch pickles, you know, like I, I used to go yeah. with Qbert, do his thing. And, yes. And there's this idea, like everybody knows like he's Filipino and like this is like a Filipino American thing, but their expression wasn't necessarily Filipino. It was, it was like a mutant musical form. And so what's interesting to see is how things are shaping up to the point where um, as a culture, uh, there are people who are interested just in purely what what is at the heart of a, a culture rather than like sort of this idea that you need to sort of like remix or like change the form of something to to make it presentable. But I, not that I think that that's what the Scratch Pickles are doing. It's just that what they were doing was so markedly hip hop in my mind. But if you lived in the Bay Area at the time, it was very markedly Filipino American, but it was really like discussed that way as a vernacular. On that note, maybe I'll start with Ben. What is inspiring you from other Filipino artists and or community? I think for me, I don't only look at uh, Filipino artists, but also look at Filipino workers. Um, yeah, I love that. And they inspired me to survive as their way of survival as well. And I think that that's like really what have been motivating me, motivating me to work and to make work and to engage with Filipinos. Cause like I, everything that they do, their tenacity, their, their, ah, uh, their, like their, their hardworking strength really just inspires me to keep going. Um, there is a, a word in Bisaya that I have learned recently and it's called padayon and it means to keep going, to push forward. And I feel like I see this to all Filipino artists in the Philippines and Filipino American um, artists and Filipino artists in the US and, and with the workers as well. And they just keep going. They're not stopping. They're unapologetic. They're taking up space. And, and, and I am inspired by all of those things that I wanna take space for myself too and for my community and cement myself in that space. Um, and be unapologetic and, and make work. I love what Ben said about taking space. I think overall, like one of these Filipino qualities of, is like being hia, like shy, like that last piece of food is all of that little piece, we call it like the hia piece. But I think like that's also like a, that can be a Filipino attitude of like, don't make waves, just put your head down. So it's been nice seeing so many uh, cultural voices, whether that be like, like, so yeah, a lot of musicians now like coming out and filmmakers, like visual artists like yourself, really like owning the space and like um, being loud about it. I think it's really great to see. I'm also very much inspired by everyday Filipino people. I mean, people going to work, like half asleep in the jeepney, but like <laughs> ready to go to whatever job they want. And so that's so inspiring and whatever projects that may happen in the future, supporting Filipino workers giving livelihoods here is like a uh, really important to me because it's so inspiring to see like the work that they do and like uh, and things like that. There's a lot of really interesting projects going on here right now. Um, in particular, I like seeing what like uh, is going on in, in this uh, town called La, uh, this province La Union, specifically a town called San Juan and it's like a surf town. And during the pandemic, these different cultural workers, people from different uh, creative communities migrated out there. There's like a script that's very kind of like, okay, they're trying to make it economically, you know, like for visitors to come, but also they're making cultural centers there. There's this project called like Emerging Islands that's like combining environmental studies with fine art. There's a, a library called Pu'on who's uh, sort of housing a lot of 
books from martial law era. And I love that it's like in the north. So like just yeah. right in the face of of the Marco Sita power, which is the locus. Yeah. You know, our culture is a working class culture primarily. And it's so nice being in this kind of generation now that like people are going into creative fields. It's not just seen as like, what are you doing in your life? And and the more that we can support that, I, I think that like, I'm, I'm super down for that. Tropical Futures. I don't know who that person is, but that's from the Philippines. Oh, CJ, I'm, yeah. Chris. I'm, I'm inspired by that. I, I, I don't really know what who it that is, but I love the what they're publishing. Uh, of course, Angela Demiuga to me is um, really inspiring. Just in this, in this, I'm, and I'm talking about it in the literal sense of like, how do they represent Filipino culture in their practice, right? And 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 from and I'm speaking to it from like the view of being in New York rather than being in the Philippines. So like, obviously, I'm I'm pretty out of touch with like the everyday Filipino. And I'm, I'm hoping to reconnect to that at some point. But um, politics, this is, a, I think, a complex question. It's like a question is uh, how does how does politics play into your work? And I think that could be thought of on, on, on many levels, um, maybe not literally like electoral politics, but various modes and ways of cultural expression that could be considered political. And Ben, I know that you have made some work that was um, pretty activist minded do you do you maybe want to um, talk about some of those works that you were performing here on the east east coast of the united states there's a work that i did in providence where i wrapped a statue it's called the hiker with a benig as a form of confrontation to white supremacy and just whiteness in general uh, i want to take this opportunity to kind of share my experience on like during the wrapping when I was literally wrapping the statue and like there are a lot of people who was telling me to like don't do that like we this is a white land we don't want our statue to be wrapped this like you're you're erasing history because they think that I'm actually like removing the statue or kind of vandalizing the statue what they didn't know is I actually got a permission from the government to do that during the wrapping they they were saying that um I was erasing like the Rhode Island history I'm not respectful of the land that took me in uh, oh God! So yeah, I, I can remember the, the person's face when he said that. This is a white land. You you can't put that in there. Remove that, like whatever that is on that statue. That um, dirty banig. Remove that dirty banig. And also, so, the statue, the hiker is also holding a gun, and that was when um, there's a lot of shooting that's happening all around the U.S. And so a friend of mine, when we wrapped that statue, we kind of put tension on the gun. Like we wrapped it in such a way that it, that it's bounded, that it's really, really bounded. It, that feels like it can't be used if it's a real gun, you know? Um, and so we're kind of like highlighting that, but also highlighting um, the the uh, how we're binding the body of the statue, but also sh showing their face, also showing the face of the statue to kind of show that like the shooting that's been happening has been happening because of you know a certain identity or a certain race or something and so I wanted to highlight those ex experiences that uh, minorities um, have been experiencing in the U.S. and that was also the time when a lot of Filipino Filipino Americans and other um, uh, Asian American communities have been dying um, or assaulted in New York and uh, in other places that's why I did that work. And I also wanted to activate it with literally confronting the work by dancing uh, and by creating a festival around it. During the activation, it was welcomed by a lot of Filipinos, um, but mostly Filipinos who, you know, appreciated the work and appreciated that their voices and histories are kind of being highlighted um, with that kind of like work. Even though like Rhode Island, right, it's like the North, it was a major port of entry for slavery like during the slave trade I think almost like one half went through Rhode Island so I think they can just like sit down, <laughs> sit down a little bit politics in my work um in the beginning or like in, in particular uh, in uh like doing books about vernacular culture it was really about like you know also sort of confronting western or the design canyon which is 
largely Western and sort of writes out a lot of global South voices within what is considered like design. It's always considered something less. Even even the word vernacular, it c- can be considered like not of a certain quality of design or it's considered like something outside of design. Untrained like, or something know, like this, right? Untrained. <laughs> untrained, unskilled, say what you really mean. Um, it's been nice to sort of challenge the, the canon in a way and, and doing such a way that also like there's a lot of life by showing it. It's not like, I think what, what Ben is saying, like, you know, you're making, making it festive, right? showing exuberance, showing that by looking at this is actually showing like possibilities in life. It's been cool seeing how, yeah, like uh, at least like locally, like uh, notions of design here has changed. And like, I, I just see wider in the world, like this acceptance of all different styles. We did do a lot of uh, work during the Duterte administration confronting the war on drugs, um, which was like just extrajudicial killings, which is like really terrible. And I have like PTSD from all of that. Clara was the subject of being harassed by trolls and almost feeling like in many ways, like she just had to leave the country for for an element of safety. Another thing about politics, like I think something that comes up more in my lectures is just that that relationship being Philippine-American, but then the history or relationship between America and the Philippines is so interesting. We kind of gaze back at the American experience and have like really sharp memories of that experience. Like streets here are named after American presidents and highways and like generals that are largely forgotten in America now. And then when you're in the States, you you know, you go to certain uh, states there, like they don't even know where the Philippines is on the map. I've been teaching this class at Pratt for a few years now. It's a platform building class, like a community. I asked the students to develop like a concept for um, a a sort of like a community-based project that this expresses itself obviously as an identity, a visual brand, or like a um, you know, like a gathering, and there's also an architectural component to it. You know, obviously, my my take on it historically within my practice has been literally with like politics. What we talk about in the class is that the gesture of even just saying, you know, like here is my like platform, it's about Arabic techno music and you know there's nothing maybe by definition there's nothing political about but about them just wanting to share like arabic like a movement of arabic style techno but in my mind that is a political gesture somehow and i haven't been able to really um, unpack that but i think a lot of elements of your practice even if by definition like are in political, there is a politi- political statement there. And so whether, whether or not it is literally like, you know, protesting or doing a, some form of activism, I think your work is very political. I taught a seminar about sort of the migrant experience through, through cinema. And, you know, th- it was a seminar. So like, we're all kind of learning from each other, but you really, you know, through the readings and all these different things and also learning from the different students' experiences, just to be a person of color in the West is innately political because with us has like so much history of wars uh conflict imperialism things that are just so out of our out of our own direct doing but also things that we embody we kind of inherit embracing something like techno music from an arab perspective it's going to have a political tinge in, in a different way than i hate to say it but like you know someone from the river in Chicago, you know what I mean? Like it's just going to have another edge. And I think that's something that we should own and, uh, and, and use as like a asset, like a privilege that I have here is I, I don't have to think about that. I that the politics of identity here as much because it's all shared. And so I have to face like, oh, wow, actually there's all other parts of my, <laughs> my identity that I need to work on that, you know, like I should be going to therapy for or something, but, <laughs> but innately, like if you are in the situation of being in the diaspora or being in the West, like you have this really awesome innate potential to do political work just by being, just by working, just by like, yeah, supporting community. Um, it's super important. The woman selling lumpia in like a shopping mall somewhere, they're doing the Lord, <laughs> they're doing like, Huge cultural work, actually, you know? It can be something micro, but actually be very macro. I, I just had this conversation uh, with a friend recently that just being brown is political. Being Filipino is political in terms of the art world. And I feel like by inserting ourselves in the work or our identity in the work becomes f- political. Um, even though we don't mean it to be political, but it it, it, it registers as if it's political. Um, there is a performance that I did uh, in grad school where I was cooking inside a cage. I was cooking adobo inside the cage. 
and it, it made the room wow. smells like adobo. <laughs> and even though I mean that to be political, everyone thinks it was political because they were they <laughs> they were implicated and they were like they were forced to smell this dish that is so unfamiliar for them. And I was like, oh, I okay, well, I guess I'll it's political. That is a perfect, perfect example. I feel like I could just keep elaborating on that, but um, I got stuck in, I, I got stuck in the thought of like being in the room when you're cooking adobo. <laughs> I love cooking and I love cooking yeah. adobo. I like yeah. me ma- yeah. and make mean adobo and I put like a lot of garlic. So like when you smell yeah, it, it's like, oh, not even just the room, but it's the whole building that will smell like adobo. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the the last question is is about is about the future and maybe what what you aspire to and it's it's such a pleasure and such an honor to speak to both of you at this time um, in your careers where there is there is this kind of like crisscrossing going on um, and I think you could speak generally about it it doesn't need to relate to being Filipino even per se just generally speaking what what are your dreams. Um, each of you in terms of like where, where where your practice is and where you want to bring it. One thing that's like kind of like sort of like like an opportunity that's also really great is just like kind of doing things more with um, environment, uh, doing like supporting more of the, the land rights uh, initiatives here, environmental initiatives and how that can, uh, I think it just does so much. I don't know what the exact project is yet, but definitely trying to um, and, and, you know, and talk with some people about like what, like how to support them properly, how can we let them grow? Because the problem in the Philippines is like, there isn't a lot of public land. It's all private. I think about eight or nine families and conglomerates own the whole thing. In any way, you know, privately, you can create access for people in some way. I think in terms of, in terms of a pipe dream, that, that would, I would love to create that as a project, just to have more people be able to like have access to that. Um, and on the other end, there's such a really vibrant, strong, creative community here, but it's it's just essentially an access to tools. The more I can support people to be able to practice here or, or vice versa, have people in the diaspora to be able to have access to things here, I, I think would be really great and like a, a really awesome opportunity. I've been sort of re- kind of rethinking and retooling my publishing practice, and I'm really excited to sort of revamp that in, in a way uh, just have a different spin on it being here now and also kind of feeling like, you know, what's chapter two of this whole thing and uh, and seeing, um, I have some things in the works and I'll be excited to share in the future, but it's exciting. I think it's a really exciting time to be here. There's actually a lot of um, migrants or expats, essentially white people <laughs> and Koreans and Japanese people who are typically more affluent than your stereotypical immigrant. Are, are, there's a lot of them moving to the Philippines now because I think they see unique opportunity or honestly the cost of living uh, overhead is like way lower than probably what they could afford um, in their native countries. And so they've been moving here for various reasons. Interesting. Um, it's been really cool to see uh, just in terms of just, um, I don't know, there's there's some opportunity here that, that can be uh, advanced i guess in some way and a lot of people i know that like are doing like extended trips there's that the, another surf town shargao is like a sense it feels like you're in another i mean you're in the philippines but I, it almost feels like 50 percent of people are like foreigners like either moving there full time like creating communities like a spanish town a french town and also they own a lot of resorts oh they really own a lot of resorts oh. in shargao and other places Okay, that's that's a little different than a typical migrant experience. Yeah, it's not the typical, but but they, but they are like you know like I want to <laughs> they are migrants, you know I'm like I want yeah. you know what I mean like, I want to like level it, yeah. And not just say like migrants aren't just brown people too, you know like like um, people who move that way. I feel like when people say expat, they're saying in a way where they don't want to be on the level of yeah another yeah. person who's right, emigrated. You know, it seems like there's a wave. I wanted to say of like of expats, migrants from all different parts of the like Africans actually. Um, I even see I was I was saying like I was in the Bureau of, of um, Immigration here and there was like Russian refugees like trying to trying to flee Putin's Russia right now. Like okay, we're all <laughs> people are just moving out here. It's really interesting. So um, are you working with any of these? 
Christian, are you working with any of these these migrant peoples? I haven't worked directly with them. There was like an architect that I met who was like from Spain and doing a bunch of architecture projects and that kind of fell through. I'm wondering, I'm like, does Christian have clients like in the Philippines or do you have clients? You And I know you're working with John, for example, in Honolulu. So you're working with people oh, sick, yeah. outside of Manila. So what is your relationship to that? Like, are you also a global? Because like, I have clients now in Hawaii, New York, California, one in Peru, one in England, mm -hmm. right? So, um, you know, I'm working with people kind of on this global, you know, perspective, but um, are you also doing that similarly like that? Or are you developing a client base that's like Philippines specific or like, how is your practice unfolding in that? We're living in a world where like, yeah, work can just come from all over now. And I yeah. think that kind of really helped making that transition from, from New York to here a, a bit seamless. And I think, uh, you know, as I'm here, as I'm just like out and about and just like meeting more folks, like more, more local opportunities are sprouting up. Actually, I kind of took the last few months as a kind of retooling period of like um, kind of trying to go out and find like more clients here just because I feel like uh, it interests me. But also it, it is cool like having clients from, from the States or from Europe or whatever and the, the, uh, them really coming to my studio practice for like whatever uh, perspective I have on design that I can I can give to them. I have other questions about that, but Ben, in terms of like futures, and I know that you're in the middle of this process still of unpacking the research and these um, experiences you're having there. How do you under how do you see yourself kind of like moving around between these perspectives? One of which is American and being here physically, and one of which is looking back into Filipino culture. How do you look forward? Well, it's kind of hard for me to kind of answer that right now because because uh, I I've, I've been feeling really sad for like leaving the Philippines. I have like eighteen days left and I don't want to leave yet. But I mean, the work that I have been doing in the Philippines, um, I, I I consider them as field notes uh, or just notes, um, just because I feel like I haven't gone to a point where I can really make and everything that I have been doing here is just kind of like collecting um learning uh, and then putting it in this like file and that that I wanted to kind of look back when I go back there and make work from it and with the documents that I have been taking the videos that I've been taking um and, and putting kind of like a documentary to to have a reference of what have been happening um, and how can I make work that is about Banig, the technique of the Banig, the usage of the Banig, the rituals. Um, but I want to I, I want to abstract all of them um, into my own experiences of, of coming here, getting lost, finding myself in this space, finding myself with the community, leaving the community, and then taking all of that to, to the U.S., how do I look forward? I actually don't know yet, uh, but I want to make work. I want to continue making work. I want to continue using um, everything that I have learned here, the indigenous experiences, the practices, the lessons, um, and just reconnecting again. I feel like my work in the Philippines is not done yet. I feel like I'm just scratching the surface. There are places that I haven't gone that have huge and and, and tactile but big practice uh, unfortunately, I couldn't go on that place <laughs> because of safety reasons. Um, mm. But I want to go back and 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 connect with them, and also reconnecting with the communities that I have um, engaged with here. Just because I I wanted to learn more. The Benig making, the Benig practice, isn't learned in like a year or like two years. It is really a tacit knowledge where your the the learning of it is by observing, by quiet observation and by engaging. And I feel like nine months of the Philippines and dividing those nine months into um uh smaller months with different communities it isn't really enough. And so I want to go back, I want to come back and and learn more and continue from there. But uh what I what I'm promising myself now is to never stop working, is to never stop looking back um and respecting everything that has happened and taking it with me thank you ben and thank, thank you, you christian you know i almost feel like i'm cutting this conversation short i mm -hmm. want to thank you both for for taking the time to share these perspectives um I'm, i am so inspired by what both of you are doing and um just wanted to say thank you for participating in this talk on the quiet before